It's a, uh, a real pleasure to be able to introduce uh, David Johnson uh, to you tonight and to have him speak on his experiences as a Fulbright uh, scholar and uh, lecturer in, uh, in Russia. David joined our faculty about almost exactly four years ago, maybe four years and uh, two weeks. He came to us after a very uh, interesting uh, career, starting with his undergraduate studies at Yale University, uh, graduating with a Bachelor of Architecture degree. He then took a uh, Master of City Planning degree and I neglected to say that as an undergraduate uh, student, he spent three summers working uh, with timber structures, unit structures. Timber structures out on uh, both in New York City and on the West Coast. He took his Master of City Planning degree. He worked in Washington. He worked in uh, New York for the Regional Plan Association. He then studied at, uh, for a doctorate in, uh, in planning at Cornell University. From Cornell, he went to, uh, to teach and to head the program in planning at Syracuse University. And he joined uh, Ball State University uh, from that uh, job as, uh, as chairman of their department at Syracuse. It was about uh, two years after he joined us, or a year and a half, that I uh, had the opportunity to sign his, uh, his application for a uh, Fulbright, saying that if he got the job, it would be okay for, uh, for him to leave us for uh, four months and to go to Russia. And so after I signed that, it was about uh, six weeks or two months later, that I was able to go to Washington and serve on the uh, Fulbright Selection Committee and again get to sign off on, uh, on Dave Johnson. And it's very nice now to have Dave serving on that same uh, Fulbright uh, Committee in Washington. And it's especially nice to have him here tonight speaking on his travels in Russia. Dave Johnson. Thank you, Charlie. That's it. Awfully nice introduction. Let's see if I can make this thing work. They don't have these in the Soviet Union, so you don't have any problems this way. It's a small thing that I'd like to do, but I'd like to dedicate this lecture to Dr. Andrei Sakharov, who was born in 1921, graduate of Moscow University, Nobel laureate. And I'd like to dedicate, dedicate it also to his wife, Elena Bona. Uh, Dr. Sakharov has, in the past week, been moved to internal exile in the city of Gorky. And the last uh, proud voice of the dissidents has been silenced. That's a sad occasion. Uh, I think you'll understand my sentiments as I go through this lecture. One can't go to visit the Soviet Union without coming back with very mixed emotions. Mixed because one becomes very much attached to the Russian people, to the Soviet peoples, and very dubious about the system that they are burdened with. We have many stereotypes about that system, and I came to understand who these people are and what they do and why they do it a lot better than I had known before I had traveled to the Soviet Union. But I am still not enamored of the way they treat their people and the way they organize their society. Uh, can we have the lights, please? My trip took me to uh, across the world and uh, I decided that it would be an, a very nice opportunity, instead of going directly from Muncie to Moscow, this trip, to go the long way around. And so I, I uh, traveled to the West Coast, to Hawaii, and then uh, to Japan. And in Japan, I caught a Soviet ship, traveled to the port of Nakhodka, 
which is near Vladivostok, Vladivostok is closed to foreigners, traveled from Vladivostok on the Trans-Siberian Railroad to the city of Khabarovsk, which is in eastern Siberia. I'm sorry, it's in the Soviet Far East. Siberia doesn't even start until you get to the city of Yakutsk uh, near Lake Baikal. And then from Lake Baikal, Yakutsk, I traveled on to Novosibirsk. And from Novosibirsk in western Siberia, I flew by airplane because by that time I had been on Trans-Siberian for five days. I flew to Moscow and then spent three months in Moscow teaching at the Moscow Institute of Architecture. Uh, during that time, I had the uh, opportunity to take several side trips, one to Leningrad uh, here on the Gulf of Finland, another trip to Armenia and the capital city of Yerevan, uh, where Turkey, Iran, and the Soviet Union meet, and then uh, departing the Soviet Union at the end of my stay, I traveled to the port of Odessa in Ukraine and took a Soviet ship to, to Athens, to Piraeus, and uh, from there then traveled on back to the United States. Uh, this is a, a map here on the other side of the world, which is uh, based on Buckminster Fuller's icosahedron. And I show it to you simply because it is very interesting. We made this map some years ago in New York to show the densities, the world population densities. And uh, one can see, traveling here across the Soviet Union, the effect of the Trans-Siberian Railroad corridor here. And if there was ever any indication that a, a rail line produced population density, you can see it across this long continent of Asia and into Europe. I'm going to take you on this trip and show you these cities that I visited. Nakhodka, no, not Nakhodka. I couldn't take pictures in Nakhodka. It's a port city. Khabarovsk, Yerkutsk, Novosibirsk, Moscow, Leningrad, Yerevan, Odessa, and home. So travel with me on this tour of the Soviet Union. My trip started uh, in Tokyo and uh, then down uh, to, on the bullet train to Yokohama, where I boarded the uh, Soviet ship Baikal. And here, uh, traveling uh, to the eastern coast of the Soviet Union, this is what it, the terrain looks like near Vladivostok. Very hilly, very beautiful, very cold, and uh, very military. And here we are entering the port of Nakhodka. Now, it is against Soviet regulations to take pictures of ports, trains, radio towers, military personnel, policemen, and just about everything else. So occasionally, if you see some pictures of those categories, uh, they were accidental, and please don't report me. We took a, a train from the port of Nakhodka. We traveled mostly at night along the Chinese border, a wonderful old train, uh, pre-revolution train. Uh, on the right is the restroom with a wonderful window. Uh, and this train took us up to meet the Trans-Siberian Railroad, uh, which was coming from Vladivostok. We were not allowed in Vladivostok. It's a closed city. And this is the countryside in, Siber in, in the far Soviet Far East, very flat. Uh, it begins to look like Siberia with its birch trees. On the right is the New Inn Tourist Hotel in Habarovsk. And here you see the Amur River, uh, which is the uh, river which... Uh, uh, a few miles away, uh, one has the Chinese border in the distance. The, the mountains uh, are right on the border of China at this point. And uh, it's a very cold and treacherous river. And the entranceway on the left is to a sports pavilion. It's, uh, it's a very green city. Most of these cities in the Soviet Far East and Siberia are very green cities. Uh, one has always the war memorials and the eternal flowers that are always put there in memory of the many people who died in the Great Patriotic War, World War II, we call it. Uh, here is the sports pavilion uh, in Habarovsk, the easternmost major city of the Soviet Union. And uh, on the right is the city hall area, the Great Square, laid out according to the principles of Milyutin, who stressed in the Soviet city 
planning that you must have a, a large square for parades and demonstrations. And here you see the square uh, and the flowers. These cities in the, in the Soviet Far East and Siberia uh, always have flowers when they can grow flowers. The Siberians are, in, are very keen on, on flowers. These are green cities, they're open cities, uh, uh, spacious that is, and they have a very good public transportation. They follow all the good principles of urban planning that we urban planners espouse. Uh, if, uh, if the political system is the requirement to have this kind of urban planning, I think I would pass it up myself. Now, here are some of the new housing one sees in the uh, city of Habarusk. Soviets have had, uh, Russian citizens have had very stringent housing conditions, but they are improving uh, gradually. The norm was nine square meters per person uh, the last time that we checked, which is not very much. And there is a great deal of crowding in these facilities, but uh, there is a lot of improvement at the same time. Habarovsk is a very interesting city. Uh, this is the, uh, the last city to uh, become Sovietized. It was a, uh, a subject of civil war after the revolution, the Russian Revolution in 1917. Some of the old buildings here date from the uh, pre-revolution era. And uh, this, uh, the building on the left is the headquarters, was the headquarters of the Russian Far East and Shipping Company, late 19th century. Very handsome buildings in these cities. And they're very, uh, the populations in these cities are very relaxed and it's very different from the cities of Moscow and Leningrad. And you can see here, good public transportation. Now, nobody has automobiles, so they have to have good public transportation. The cities are very uh, pleasant, and there are many old buildings, which is, many of which are being preserved. They're, they're doing a pretty good job of keeping up the old buildings. Uh, uh, and there is a strong preservation movement, particularly for the old Russian culture. You, you begin to see here on the right uh, in the slide, at this, on this side, the... Uh, the wooden buildings, which uh, you see all through the Soviet Far East and Siberia. And these buildings are being lost very rapidly. It is very unfortunate. But they are very beautiful buildings. Some date from the 19th century, uh, some even earlier. They are denigrated by Soviets because they are supposed to be old-fashioned. They have not decided that these are buildings worth keeping in large numbers. They will keep one or two as representative, but that's all. They say people don't like to live in them. And, uh, but they are wonderful buildings and uh, uh, beautiful carvings. They're losing them very rapidly. Now, here we are. We have met the Trans-Siberian. And uh, this is the interior of the Trans-Siberian. The Russians don't call it Trans-Siberian. They call it Russia. Trans-Siberian is the Western word for it. They don't like it to be called Trans-Siberian. This is the interior. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see us running to get some mushrooms or salad or potato skins or something that they're selling. Uh, the meals on the Rossiya are very nice. Breakfast, uh, lunch, and dinner, it's all the same. They just change the menus. And we arrive now at the capital of eastern Siberia, Yerkutsk. And each city has its own medallion. Yerkutsk uh, is a, uh, has this medallion. It's an otter capturing another creature. And... Uh, this is the center of fur trade and has always been center of fur trade in the Soviet Union. Again, you see the flowers on the right, the main street of Yerkutsk. Yerkutsk is called the Paris of Siberia, if you can imagine such a thing. Uh, and it's called that because the czars exiled so many noblemen to this city in the, in the 19th century, troublemaking noblemen. And they brought their culture with them, and some of them were uh, oriented to building beautiful cities, and they built a very handsome city in Yerkutsk. It's a lovely city. Uh, the first thing they took us to, however, uh, was the, the memorial to the World War II, or the Great Patriotic War, uh, heroes. And you see the young Komsomol uh, changing God here. And uh, they claim that the Gustep is something that they had before the, the Nazis, and that the uh, it's not really a fascist Gustav. I've never liked Gustavs myself. But Yerkutsk is, better, is more famous, more enjoyable for the old churches, the beautiful old churches. This was the seat of the archbishop whose diocese took in 
believe it or not, all of Alaska and California. And uh, he, this city of Yakutsk is two and a half days by train from the Pacific Ocean. But, uh, and I'm not sure the archbishop ever got over there, but he was in charge of, of building uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Russian uh, religion in North America. Incidentally, did you know that the bells for the Spanish missions were cast by uh, Russian priests who knew bell casting? Uh, there was some trade back and forth in the, in the 16th century. These are some of the old churches, Russian Orthodox churches, working churches, which are being restored in Yerkutsk. Uh, again, you see very extensive restoration projects going on. The old, old churches now are being tended to, partly because of tourism, but partly because there is an increasing pride in, in the cultural background of Russia as distinct from communism. And it perhaps is a way of separating the people, separating themselves from communism. And the writings of Solzhenitsyn, I think, are part of this resurgence of this, the return to the spirit of old Russia. And very handsome, beautiful churches uh, with icons on the outside. I had never seen icons elsewhere painted on the outside of these churches. And here is the tomb uh, of one of the explorers of Alaska who was brought, he came back and uh, was buried here. And he was uh, prominent in, in the uh, activities in Alaska. The Russians, of course, sold Alaska to us. And when we went in these churches, there would be uh, church services going on. And here is the main street of Yerkutsk, and you can see why it's called Paris of Siberia. And these, of course, are all pre-revolution buildings. And note all the trees. The trees, the Soviets do plant trees. And you have to give them great credit for their tree planting schemes. When you graduate from the University of Moscow, the ritual is to plant a tree. I think it would be a very useful thing if we adopted that ritual. And you can see again the old buildings, the wooden buildings, which is so pleasant. But many of them also classical buildings. And here's the main market area for Yerkutsk. Uh, very busy outdoor market. At, on this, at this time it was closed, but uh, during the during the week, it's very busy, and the farmers can bring their produce from their little farm patches that they're allowed to have, in addition to working on collective farms. And uh, here you see, even in Yerkutsk, the principles of socialist town planning with the large square, the fountain, the heavy-handed uh, public uh, governmental buildings, and the invariable banners and slogans to tell you that uh, uh, what you have is about as good as you can get public transportation, again, very good. Use of a lot of overhead uh, electric uh, bus, trolley buses. These are some buildings that are post-war, World War II buildings. And it's sometimes it's very hard in Soviet Union to tell the 1950s Stalinist buildings from pre-war buildings or old 19th century buildings because they were so clever at eclecticism. Stalin liked old buildings, and he liked his new buildings to be old. But I'll show you some of that in Moscow. Again, here along the Angara River, which flows north to the Arctic Ocean through Yakutsk, you have flowers, a very handsome uh, esplanade along the river. Uh, the Angara, one of the great rivers of the Soviet Union and harnessed for hydroelectric power. On the right, the Gastanitsa Angara, is the hotel, the main hotel in, in Yerkutsk. And here is some, this is the, again the uh, hotel, Gastanitsa uh, Angara. Uh, and on the right is a, uh, an apartment over a fish store, and that says o Ocean, Okean. And they sell fish in the bottom. You, these are some new buildings in Yerkutsk to give you some idea of new construction in the Soviet Union. And the juxtaposition of old and new, you see frequently. Here are some newer buildings. The hotel on the right was a scandal. It had been sitting untouched. It had been half completed. 
uh, for about two years, they hadn't been able to do any work on it. It's the hotel in tourists, and, and uh, the complaint is that they can't get construction help in Siberia. And there was a scandal because the the local entrepreneur, I mean, the local manager could not finish this, this hotel. And uh, they do have billboards. On the, on the right, you see something very interesting. It's a self-help preservation project. And uh, they do have, uh, it is possible to own your own units and to restore them, in, uh, at least in Yerkutsk. And this couple is uh, working on their, on their restoring this old building to their, make it an apartment for their own use. So there is self-help restoration. And uh, I toured this area with a civil engineer from Hong Kong, and he told me that these were very archaic cranes. I'm not an expert in cranes, but he said they're very old-fashioned. But uh, I thought I, you might be interested in seeing what kind of construction equipment they use. I might mention that uh, the largest cranes I saw used in the Soviet Union were all manufactured in the United States. But these were used in Red Square to hang the portraits of Brezhnev and the Kosygin on, uh, on the buildings. And again, the beautiful uh, wooden buildings all scattered through the old city, the old parts of Yerkutsk. And again, they're being torn down very rapidly, a very sad situation. The buildings, the windows are invariably uh, blue, yellow, or ochre, I should say, and, uh, and uh, tan to represent the elements of the earth, the sky, the grass, and uh, the earth. Very handsome buildings. I think the locals were very irritated. I was taking so many pictures of these wooden buildings because they thought they were so old-fashioned and I was going to give them a bad reputation. And again, the main street, telephone booth, and the Angara River. Now, let's, I want to take a little detour here and show you the, the great lake Baikal, which is just south of here, and which lies between Yerkutsk and the border of Outer Mongolia. Lake Baikal is, has one-sixth of the fresh water supply of the world, an extraordinary, lake, beautiful lake, and uh, a subject of some concern about pollution uh, among Soviet environmentalists, and uh, they have stopped the construction of industry on this lake uh, so far. Here you see the Angara River, which drains Lake Baikal, flows north to the Arctic. Most of the uh, rivers in the Soviet Union flow north rather than south, and many of them are now being developed for hydroelectric power. And here is, on the, on the left, you see the, uh, the uh, Soviet Academy of Sciences Oceanographic Laboratory for investigating environmental effects in Lake Baikal. On the right, you see a Soviet uh, couple who have just been married, and they have come down to throw their wedding wreath in the waters of Angara for good luck. And we come down uh, to the lake. You have to climb high to see the lake into the taiga, the woods, you know, the Siberian woods. And you climb and you see the snow-capped mountains uh, overlooking out of Mongolia. And here is the lake. This must be one of the most beautiful lakes in the world, enormous. And we see only a small uh, arm of the lake at this point. And there are several hundreds of rivers that flow into this lake, but only one drains at the Angara. And you can see the mountains to the south. And beyond that, those mountains is Outer Mongolia, which is a fiefdom of the Soviet Union, is subservient to the Soviet Union. Near the, near the borders of Baikal, it was a very pleasant little village in, which had been kept in very good condition. And uh, as I walked up this road, the strains of Tchaikovsky came out of one of the houses. It was an absolutely enchanting scene. And then I turned around and looked in the, uh, in, in the garden, and there was one of the residents, stone drunk, out cold. But that's what you, the kind of juxtapositions you find in Russia. Each uh, of these houses had a little garden, which they kept very, very well. And it's a private garden, so they tend to it very carefully. 
The private gardens which they're allowed produce an enormous amount of the agriculture, the food of the Soviet Union. The collective farms are a great disaster. And the flowers, again, flowers everywhere. This time in the windows and beautiful ornaments around the windows, the village well, just a lovely place. And Siberia is filled with these little villages. This was no special place. And then we walked up into the taiga, and one must go to Siberia and see the taiga, the beautiful woods which cover that whole vast area. And they're mostly birches, but they're mixed with the deciduous evergreens, other kinds of trees. So you get this very subtle effect. And the, notice the birches are all vertical. And in, uh, in America, the birches fall over. I don't know what that means, but the birches uh, uh, stand straight in Soviet Union. Siberia. And this is the this is the taiga. Beautiful woods. Well, so much for Yakutsk, which is the capital of eastern Siberia. Then I went to western Siberia, two more days on the train, through the taiga, birches, 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 and came to the city of Novosibirsk, capital of western Siberia. This is the opera house in the western in Novosibirsk. And uh, the invariable statue of Lenin that you find. And as I approached Moscow and came into the city, it became more tense. And the closer I got to Moscow, it became more tense and more closed. And this city was, was not as pleasant as Yakutsk. This building was finished during World War II. Uh, it, was a, it was in progress before World War II. And uh, a very curious building. It's the main opera house and theater in the city. Again, see the flowers. Siberia is filled with flowers. Here are the heroes of labor of Novosibirsk. Always you will have these pictures up of the people who are, have the highest uh, uh, party evaluations as workers. On the right, uh, Stalinist uh, housing on the main square. Some old buildings. Now, Novosibirsk has some very interesting old buildings from pre-revolution. And this is a, a restaurant, an electric supply house. And uh, this dates from about, I guess, 1900. But there's some very interesting uh, 1920s buildings, too, in this city. Uh, these are memorials to the Civil War. After the Russian Revolution, there was a terrible civil war between the whites and the reds in this area. And the Reds uh, eventually took Novosibirsk. Uh, and here are some interesting uh, uh, 1920s. Well, the one on the left is, a, is really a Art Nouveau, and the one on the right is a workers' club from the 1920s after the revolution. And here are some other interesting uh, uh, structures from the 1920s when architecture flowered right after the revolution. And there was a great deal of experimentation. The exhibition outside in the exhibition area of Leona Div uh, shows you some of the work that was going on in the 20s. And this is some that was built. The building on the left was built in the 1950s. And this is what Stalin enjoyed building. And he filled Moscow with it, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, here is a department store, it's Gum. No, I'm sorry, it's Sum. There's Sum and there's Gum. This is a department store in Novosibirsk. On the right, again, wooden buildings. You see very handsome wooden buildings. And here also, they're losing them. Except the one on the left here is the headquarters for the Neighborhood Association. So this will be saved. And I thought that was a very nice kind of gesture. So from Novosibirsk, I flew to Moscow and uh, moved all the way across 11 time zones. Uh, here's Lake Baikal, Novosibirsk is here, and then I flew to Moscow, which is here. And Moscow is uh, a, an interesting city from a planning point of view. Uh, this map is the plan of 1935, this, the Stalin plan. I point out some things here that we should keep in mind as we look at Moscow. The Moscow River, which meanders through the city, 
and the concentric quality of the city with the Kremlin in the middle and then successive ring roads around it. And today there is a major highway ringing the, the city. The highway itself is the boundary of the city, so you know exactly where you are. Uh, Moscow was very grim compared to the free feeling of Siberia. And here we see Red Square and St. Basil's, very famous. And I'd like to show you <clears throat> the Olympic site, the former Olympic site, sitting on the Moscow River and uh, some of the panorama of the city. Uh, we're standing in front of Moscow University where I was housed, and here's the Moscow River. This is the Olympic site, and uh, here is the main Olympic stadium. And here is a ski jump, which uh, uh, is used for winter sports, although I'm told nobody ever dares jump off these ski jumps. They're so enormous, they're just there for decoration. And you can see the uh, Stalinist wedding cake um, towers, which dot the skyline. I think there are seven of them in all. And uh, they give some character to the city. And they're very interesting structures. And here you see the, uh, the main stadium. They are building, uh, this building was here, Lenin Stadium. They're building some light standards so they can have games at night. They're also building some additional stadia here uh, for athletes and I mean for uh, various events. Uh, some of the other events will not be in Moscow. They'll be up in uh, other cities of the Soviet Union. But the main events are in this area along the Moscow River. And uh, here's another picture of the skyline. Uh, you can see the, some of the dramatic skies that one gets uh, in this latitude. The river gives a great deal of character to the city, and uh, its moods change, its colors change. And they, in the uh, post-war period, they have done a very nice job of capturing the, the river and uh, providing walkways and highways along it, uh, and then banking it. It was uh, a major city planning undertaking uh, in the Stalinist era. We see several buildings that are worth pointing out, new buildings. Most of this was Stalin architecture. The, all of this, the, these structures, these apartments, and other kinds of buildings were built as part of this major redevelopment along the river. This building is, a, is not completed. In fact, work is stopped on it uh, while the Olympic construction is going on. It is the, uh, the office building for the Russian Soviet Federal Republic. And uh, it's a uh, uh, rather crude building. This building is the headquarters of Comic-Con, the eastern equivalent of the common market. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about my living conditions. I was uh, based at the University of Moscow Although I was not teaching at the University of Moscow, uh, I was housed in the vicinity. This is the University of Moscow, the pride of Joseph Stalin. He took great pleasure in helping to design this building. And nothing was spared to uh, build this building. It took, many, it took a decade to construct it. Uh, very handsome surroundings. I find the building rather ominous in itself, but some people don't seem to object to it. And uh, here is the main entrance way. It looks like something out of Schinkel. Moscow University. And uh, I used to run around Moscow University with a ball you sweatshirt on. I don't know what they made of me, but uh, nobody ever stopped me. This is the university hotel where I was housed, and uh, I was up on this floor about here. And these are some of the other Fulbright faculty who were housed in the uh, hotel with me. This is my room. I had uh, about uh, 10 square meters to live in, and uh, uh, it was just barely enough to carry on business in the hallway on the right. Outside my window, I could watch the Olympic uh, housing being built in this area. 
And that would be that was to be the Olympic Village, and it's covered now with apartment buildings. And here's the view out of my window. You can see some of the apartment structures and the invariable advertising for the Soviet party. And you can see here a work crew running, walking through, cleaning up, picking up the uh, debris in the, in the median strip. Again, it's a very open green kind of setting. This is the uh, Architecture Institute. This is Architecture Institute, where I taught. And I gave uh, three lectures, or I, actually I gave one lecture a week and two seminars, and uh, had packed classes. It was a, a marvelous audience. They were just starved to hear about the United States. They weren't allowed to talk to me outside the classroom, but they uh, were very enthusiastic inside the classroom. They, they have just uh, acquired another annex building over here, which is next to the, this is the corner of this building, and their facilities have now been uh, greatly enlarged. This is the leading uh, institution for instruction in architecture in the Soviet Union and uh, for, uh, for urban planning. And here is the uh, interior. You can see they have uh, modular boards. The models and the drawings are all on the same size panel. And they're put on boards, and they can put them up in these little grooves, and they always fit. Everything has to be the same size in the Soviet Union. Here is the faculty of city building, or the city planning faculty. And I had my office in there. Uh, and every day I'd go in and see Mr. Brezhnev and Mr. Lenin. One of the chief occupations in the Institute is to design uh, pedestals for statues of uh, Vladimir. And you can see all the pedestals that are, they take pride in. That's how they keep honest, and then they can do anything else they want. Actually, they're very free spirits in that place, and I really have to admire all the things they get away with in that society. This is their exhibition area, and the man is watching everything they're doing, of course. But here we are playing a game. And I would like you to hear a little bit of this game. This is Urban Dynamics. And it's a capitalist game, like Monopoly. And they got very excited about this game. And they started becoming entrepreneurs, selling property, and uh, calling each other, uh, not Tovarish, which is comrade, but Gospodin, which is the old capitalist form of address. They lapsed into it. So I was very subversive using this urban dynamics game. And these were students from all over Moscow. They were not just from the Institute, but they were allowed to come in from all the institutes and play, play this game. And they enjoyed it. That's, that's, okay, that's enough of the uh, game. Thanks. I might say that the, the most popular game to buy in Moscow is Monopoly. And there is a Russian version of it, believe it or not. You see it on the, on the metro all the time. And there are all kinds of anomalies like that. Here is the House of Architects. This is where you go if you're an architect and uh, you want to have dinner out, take a guest, and you can go to the House of Architects here. So you see it's very architectural. And it has an annex here, very modern kind of thing. I think it was kind of pathetic. Across the street, they had put up a very nice apartment house to make sure that you knew it was the House of Architects. And this was a very... Uh, prestigious place for party members to live. If you think it's an egalitarian society, it's not. It's full of privilege. The party gets everything it wants. How did we eat? This is the Uzbekistan restaurant. And we had to stand in line here. And uh, this is where I had my first fist fight, or near fist fight, shoving match, with these Uzbekis who had come. You see the hat? And uh, we uh, waited to get in, and we waved our American passport, and that, that didn't get us anything. So finally, we pushed and shoved and finally got in. Meanwhile, all kinds of other people were showing little cards and getting in on the side. Well, they were all obviously party members. And the Uzbekis are very interesting. They're very spontaneous, very different from the Russians. Uh, this is my wife. She came over for a visit in Red Square. I took in, taking a picture of her in front of St. Basil's. And this Uzbeki woman came up and planted herself right next to Eleanor and smiled and took the, had her picture taken and then just broke up in laughter. She thought it was the funniest thing she had done. And it was the only spontaneous thing I'd seen in all of Moscow in all my time there. 
I think that's why they're afraid of the Central Asians. They're just too spontaneous. St. Basil's, of course, a marvelous building. Uh, when uh, Ivan the Terrible finished with this building, the, uh, he had the two architects killed because he didn't want to have anybody else getting as nice a building. So they, they paid a heavy price for designing this building. Uh, the Kremlin, of course, this, the heart of Moscow. And uh, here's a very interesting story. These towers were designed by Italians. From this, these were Italians brought in to design these towers around the Kremlin. And uh, beyond the tower, this main entrance, uh, you see the Palace of Congresses, which was inserted into the Kremlin. And a uh, very interesting story behind this. But this building, while it was designed by Soviet architects, Russian architects, they didn't trust the Russian construction industry to build it, so they hired an Italian building firm to come in and build this building. And this is where the main party congresses are held. And uh, so there's something ironic about the Italians having done this and having done this as well. And, uh, and a few more views of this wonderful, very Italian tower. Now here you see the Palace of Congresses and in the interior during a party session. And this was inserted. It wasn't a bad job of inserting it into the Kremlin. It hasn't done too much damage. And the Kremlin, of course, half of it is open, half of it is not. This is the, uh, the main governmental offices where Mr. Brezhnev and party uh, hang their hats and, uh, and decide to uh, send their Red Armies to Afghanistan. That's off limits. That was designed incidentally, by Italians, too. Uh, this is the armory, a very handsome building. And uh, here is where the treasures of the Kremlin are kept. And uh, there's a major restoration project going on in, in the Kremlin for the uh, visitors to the Olympics. So they've done a great deal of repair and gold leafing and so on. Here you can see some of the uh, work being done on the uh, Cathedral of the Assumption, the Spensky Cathedral. It's a very painstaking task to put the gold leaf on up there. And they've done a great deal in recent days. Here you see uh, another church in the Kremlin's interior being restored, worked on. And uh, there are numerous chapels of the Tsars in the Kremlin compound. Here is an ancient city gate from the 18th century. Well, it's not ancient, but it's, it's older than many things in Moscow, from the 18th century, which was preserved. And here you see the corner of the Art Nouveau Hotel Metropole which was the seat of government when Lenin came down from Leningrad, uh, Petrograd. A few city, city scenes, oh, invariably the posters. There are no license plates in Moscow. You paint the license plate on the back of the vehicle. A Russian wolfhound. We stopped to say hello to this woman who was walking around the corner and admire her dog. Immediately, this man walked over to eavesdrop on us. Parks. There are many parks in Moscow. It's a very green city, and the children are uh, are uh, very much coddled and taken care of. Uh, they're really babied, much more than American children. Uh, I guess it's because they face such a grim future that they are cuddled when they're small. But they are very cute children. They're very pleasant, uh, and they love to go take them to the circus. This is the new circus building near the university. And it's lots of fun. And every city in the Soviet Union has a circus building and its own resident circus. A piece of uh, old Russian architecture, the domes, uh, the chapels are, are just marvelous. The silhouettes uh, delight. And uh, it is preserved in very good condition. The walls, very handsome. Here's the entranceway. And uh, it's, some of the churches are still working churches inside. Novo Devici, it's called. And the freestanding bell towers, rather Italianate. And there's a burial ground here. This is the convent that Boris Gudunov banished his wife to. <clears throat> now, I want to show you something, uh, another, another fortified citadel. This is southwest of Moscow, and this is called Kolomonskoye. And uh, you see the traditional entranceway. This is the entrance to the compound. 
it sits on the Moscow River and uh, it, it overlooks the river and it was intended to be both a religious facility and a fortress to protect it from invasions. Now the city is reaching out towards it. You can see the, the housing projects. And uh, one of the most marvelous and earliest of the old churches is this ancient church. I can't date it, but uh, it is under restoration now and it's just a stupendously powerful building. I'm just absolutely overwhelmed by it. And uh, there is a collection being taken up by the Historic Preservation Group in the Soviet Union to, to return this to its original condition. And I should say that preservation in the Soviet Union is really very well advanced. They're very sensitive to uh, the uh, notion of protecting uh, all the original fabric. The sign says restoration, architect, so on, tells who is doing it and so forth. And it is the, under the auspices of the Museum of Kolomanskoye. And here are some later structures, bell towers, in the compound being restored. You can see the weather is not always the best in the Moscow. I think I saw the sun all of about a tenth of the time I was there. Now, I wanted to show you something else that is very interesting. Further down the river, I spotted this later, this older church. It was not in the compound. And I, so I started walking. And I kept walking and walking because it looked like a very interesting silhouette. And I didn't know it was off limits. And I got up to it and found that uh, it was abandoned. It had, had been some work was being done on it. And I walked into the graveyard and I found all the tombstones pushed over and all the graves dug up. And it was very spooky. And then I realized what had happened, that uh, there was a, this graveyard had been mutilated by uh, the uh, regime which wanted to discourage the use of this facility for burials. And this was confirmed to me later by an Orthodox priest who told me that uh, the families were burying their dead in this uh, old churchyard. And uh, to stop it, they had come in and uh, they had dug it up and, and uh, desecrated it. And I'm sure these pictures would not be very much appreciated by the KGB. Well, I, I got picked up by the KGB. And uh, I was out walking outside this hotel, Rossiya, the biggest hotel in Europe, very ugly thing. And uh, it just happened to be the day I didn't have my passport. I had turned in my passport because I wanted to go to another city and you have to get a visa to travel anywhere in the country. So I had no papers. And the guy kept saying, documenti, documenti. And I didn't have anything. He said, no, I'm an American professor. What are you trying to do? Because I said it in Russian. He thought I was a Russian, I guess. And he kept going and going on. And finally, it had hit me that I had one document. It was my library card from the Lenin Library, which is this, which is identical to a KGB card. I've seen KGB cards. So I flashed my Lenin Library card. And he said, oh, yeah, da, 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 da. And so, so this is what did it. This is what did it. And he let me go. So I'm very grateful to the Lenin Library for giving me this library card. Uh, I show you here, this is uh, Detsky Mir, nice department store in the middle of Moscow, about two blocks from the Institute. I, I took this picture not for this nice department store, but for this building here, because this is as close I was able to get or willing to get, to take a picture of Lubyansk KGB headquarters. <laughs> and uh, I was told if I took a picture of KGB headquarters straight out, I'd probably get my camera taken away. It has seven stories underneath the ground, and it is connected by a tunnel to the Kremlin. And if you want to read about Lubyansk, read Solzhenitsyn. Uh, the Lenin Library. This is the new building of the Lenin Library. This is Pat Pashkov House. It was a house of a merchant, which is now connected to this building, which is over here. And it is the Children's Library. And it's right near the, the, uh, right near the uh, Kremlin. It's a very handsome old structure, and I'm delighted that they saved it. I think there's a, yes, here's a picture, an early picture of the Pashkov house, uh, early 19th century building. So they, they, they do take care of their, their old buildings. Here is another merchant's house, and this is the uh, residence of the American ambassador. This is where Boland and Harriman and uh, Kennan lived, and where the uh, current uh, ambassador, uh, 
Mr. Watson, the IBM executive, lives. It's a wonderful old house. It was built in the, early, in the uh, late 19th century. Spazo House, it's called. And it's right near Kalinin Prospect. This is the American embassy. It's within walking distance. You walk into the uh, ambassador's house, and there's a wonderful portrait of Ben Franklin's right in the foyer. And it really makes you feel at home. Here's the American emb current American embassy on the Sadovia, the ring road, which was punched through uh, uh, around Moscow. And across the street is this apartment house. Both of these Stalin era buildings. The microwaves go from here to here. <laughs> I had a very nice uh, Thanksgiving dinner up here in the uh, first, uh, the political offices apartment. It turned out he was from Kokomo and his brother had gone to Ball State, so we got along well. And I said, how did you uh, find a turkey? And they said, well, you know, you could bring it in from Copenhagen and it's very simple to cook it. We just hold it out the window. <laughs> uh, but they like Americans. They like Americans in Moscow and uh, so much so that anything that they have uh, that it says U.S. on, they will proudly display. In fact, some clever Armenians got together and are producing these uh, university bags from St. Louis University and selling them in Moscow is the real thing. Of course, we'd never spell St. Louis this way, so it gives it away. I was walking in front of the embassy one day and uh, a very attractive Russian woman was carrying a, a bag like this and uh, I nearly collapsed in laughter on the sidewalk. It said, American Breeders Association. <laughs> This is the site of the new embassy, which is to be built shortly. It's right near, it's right behind the old embassy, and uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill of San Francisco office have the uh, contract for this building. The interesting thing is it's been under negotiation for about 10 years. The new Soviet embassy, which was to be built exactly the same time, is ready for occupancy in Washington. I went to a a service in Moscow. This was the, uh, the service uh, in this church, a working church on the, uh, one of the neighborhoods in Moscow, and it was jam-packed. It was a beautiful service, and it was, it was just absolutely mobbed with people who were uh, young, old, middle-aged, and it really is remarkable. There is a resurgence of the Orthodox Church. It must be frightening to the authorities. And there were police cars all around this church, and I was told that Behind the altar, there were uh, policemen photographing the congregation. Uh, there are many, Moscow's filled with beautiful buildings. This is the Ménage, the riding stable uh, of Alexander in the middle of the city, and uh, is now an exhibition hall, completely restored. The great Bolshoi Ballet, 18, uh, early 1800s, restored right through. Here is the Moore and Melody's department store, pre-revolution. Very interesting building. And I'll just flash through quickly through some of these scenes of Moscow without commenting. But just to show you the richness of the buildings in this city. And uh, there's a big debate going on as to whether to save these buildings, to keep it a museum city, as some of the people say. We can't afford to leave Moscow a museum city. We must tear these buildings down and build at higher densities. This is the, the original building of Moscow University. And this was in the old Arbat district. And here we are on uh, uh, Kropotkinskaya Ulitsa, Kropotkin Street, a street lined with gorgeous buildings, 19th century buildings, one after the other. Some, some later, some Art Nouveau, and some classical. A very rich city for architectural historians. Probably the leading city after Brussels for Art Nouveau that is intact. And here is some of the, the older Russian architecture around the, the Red Square area the Duma and the City Hall. Gum, 
dating from about 1906, a department store on Red Square. The Morostov House, now the house of friendship for all peoples. Soviet citizens are not allowed to go in. <laughs> this is the, Len the Leningrad station, and this is the Yaroslavl station by Schechtel. At the turn of the century, there's some very interesting work going on, very much like uh, some of the work in, of Peter uh, Behrens and that group. Uh, and uh, you see Schechtel was very interested in uh, old Russian kinds of forms. And here is the apartment house in that genre from around the turn of the century. And the Trechikov Gallery, very interesting building, all harking back to early Russian forms, eclectic, but in a very interesting way. Again, this uh, uh, Perzov apartment house on the Moscow River, very interesting turn of the century. And you see some Art Nouveau here in this structure. And uh, the Ryabushnikov house, one of the great Art Nouveau buildings in, 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 in Moscow, gorgeous building, and uh, called the Gorky house because Gorky lived there, but uh, Gorky had nothing to do with it. When the revolution came, they told, uh, the, they told the troops, don't destroy buildings. They put these posters up. This was a 1917 uh, poster to save the old buildings. I thought that was kind of interesting. And uh, so there was some sensitivity to the old stuff. And after the revolution, uh, there was very, there's a great deal of excitement about design. And uh, uh, you've got people like Melnikov and Ginsberg designing, and Leonardov. Uh, we have the exhibition outside. And they, they had workers' clubs. And this was a, a workers' club in Moscow. And this, this is the entrance, of little stairways up here. This was supposed to be a little place for people to go, or to, a band to stand or a speaker to go up on and address the crowd who would be out here. And this would be a place for the workers to go because they weren't housed very well, they didn't have any place to go. And they built workers' clubs all over Moscow in the 20s, and they, many of them are very interesting architecturally. This is the, uh, the workers' club for uh, uh, theater people or movie people. It was originally uh, the, the club for, uh, for, for, ex, for released prisoners. Uh, but the released prisoners, it got to be very embarrassing during the purges because they thought uh, it was for released prisoners of communists, not the released prisoners of the czars and the, the whites. So they turned it into a movie uh, club for the movie actors. And it's a very interesting 20s building. Melnikov himself designed his own house in the 1920s. Can you imagine uh, designing your own house uh, in the communist? Uh, he was greatly criticized for doing it, too. Uh, and he died in, uh, in uh, disrepute. He was a professor at the Institute. He taught at the Institute, but it fell into disfavor in the 30s. And all of these 20 visionary people fell into disfavor while the hacks came to power. And some of the hacks are still there and still running that institute. It's very interesting to look at some of the older types who are the old Stalinists. And uh, this building, Melnikov lived in this building uh, until his death, uh, oh, about eight years ago, 10 years ago. And he came out of seclusion to do something at the Seattle World's Fair, I'm told. But up until that point, he was really uh, not heard from. But this was 1920s, very interesting work. You can see that I'm not sure it's so successful a penetration of the skin. It's in fair condition. Uh, another interesting building right near the American Embassy, hardly known, hidden in the back, is this collective apartment house, the Ginsburg House, which is falling to pieces from 1921, something like that. Long before Corbusier was doing a lot of things, they were building these things. And uh, it was on Piloti, and uh, you see all the, all the kinds of things that Corbusier was doing. And it had a common kitchen. People would live in these apartments, and they'd live in the have a common kitchen and cook in. Four years after the, uh, five years after the revolution, they were doing this. So you can see what a free kind of spirit there was in that place during the Lenin years. A marvelous building. It should be restored and saved, 
but it's not being preserved. It's in very bad condition. And it is not very desirable as housing. And I'm told that it was designed to be have the feeling of an ocean liner. And you, it had awnings uh, up here, and uh, it was a very, very uh, buoyant and, and uh, vital kind of building. See, okay. Uh, yeah. Now, what happened to, to these 20s architects was that uh, Stalin did not like them. When Lenin died in 1924, Stalin came to power. He had a different view of architecture, took a very great interest in architecture, and brought the hacks to the fore. This man was not particularly a hack. He was Shushev. Shushev. He was a teacher at the Institute. He made his mark with the Kazan railroad station in 1914 before the revolution. And you can see he was harking back to some of the early Soviet uh, themes, the uh, classicizing themes. And he came to the attention of Stalin when he designed the temporary catafalque for Lenin in 1924. This was the original of this building, which was later put in in Red Square. And this was so successful that this was put in, and it mimicked the wooden structure, the temporary wooden structure that had been there. And so Shushev became a very prominent designer in the 30s, designed the, Depart the uh, Ministry of Agriculture building, and a very interesting building near Red Square, uh, near the Kremlin. This is the uh, Moscow Hotel. And Stalin, uh, you see, it's very interesting because it has a wing here, it's a metrical building, wing here, see this wing here. And this building was all put up at one time. What happened was that uh, he took his drawings to Stalin two alternatives, and Stalin approved both of them. So he had no choice but to do one wing of one kind and one of the other. And uh, that's how the people designed in those Stalin years. A very heavy-handed building. He also designed some of the most elaborate uh, metro stations. This is the Komsomolskaya station in... Uh, in Moscow. This is the top of it. This is what you see when you go in. You see the M stands for metro. You go downstairs and you go, you're in a palace. Unfortunately, some of these early metro stations, Stalin had uh, beautiful cathedrals torn down to get the marble to build the stations. <coughs> One of the most interesting buildings that was built in the Stalin period was the, uh, or attempted, was the Palace of Soviets. There was a great competition held for this building. Unfortunately, it was built on the site of the main cathedral, 19th century building, a uh, rather ugly building, but it was a church uh, of some prominence on the Moscow River. All the old Russian women said, ah, they would never finish that building. It had a great statue of Lenin on top. It was going to be the tallest building in the world. And uh, sure enough, they dug the foundations, and building it next to the river, they couldn't keep the water out. And they had the structure up to about here when World War II hit. So they needed the steel, so they dismantled the, the steel, and uh, they had a big excavation here along the river. And they decided that since the foundation was starting to tip, maybe it was a good idea not to build the building after all. And all the Russian women, the old uh, babushka said, uh, we told you so. So what did they do? They built a great swimming pool in the foundation. And this is the great outdoor swimming pool for Moscow, but it really is the foundation for the palace of Soviets, that building I showed you, the Palace of Congress, is, is the substitute for this building, which they finally decided to put inside the Kremlin. Now, there was a very interesting designer by the name of Chukovsky, who worked at the Institute. He designed this building uh, about 1950. This is 1950, I kid you not. And this is the, was the headquarters. This was the American consulate, uh, American embassy for a period of time. But uh, later now, it be, has become the headquarters of in tourist. And Chotovsky was a very interesting fellow. He did everything very beautifully. I want you to look at this building he designed on the Sadovia, not far from the American embassy. And tell me what you see that's very interesting or different about it. I bet you can't see it. I didn't see it until it was pointed out to me. It has to do with rhythms. This man was trying to send a message, even in the Stalin era. He's trying to send a message that we can do some things that maybe are a little different. This is mannerism. Look at this building. See the, the arch window here? OK, 
Count the windows. Four. Arch window. Five windows. Count the windows. Six windows. Seven windows. And no windows. It's going out into space. Look at the cornice line here. It collapses. You know? He was saying, look up here. It collapses here. He was saying something. Very secretly. And Stalin approved it and he had a laugh. Here's what Stalinist architecture looked like at the heyday of Stalinism in the 50s. This is the West Point of the uh, Soviet Union. There used to be a big tank up here, but it was an old-fashioned tank. It also be the with the name of Stalin right here. So instead of just put, putting another piece of uh, stone in there, they just pulled it out, and that's how they obliterated Mr. Stalin. So, but he takes his revenge. It's a wonderful building. That's the uh, Soviet Military Academy. Gorky Street, very interesting place that Stalin had built. The Red Stone, very characteristic of Gorky Street, all of Gorky Street lined with this red stone, brought there by the Germans, the Nazis, who were going to level Moscow and use this red stone to build a great monument after the defeat of Moscow. And Stalin had the last laugh. He built Gorky Street with the German red stone. Uh, this building, another Stalinist building. Believe it or not, this is the Supreme Court of the Soviet Union. Yes, they do have a Supreme Court. And that's where, if you want to appeal, being sent to Gorky, why you take your appeal right here. Uh, the wedding cakes I talked about. Interesting buildings. This is the University of Moscow. This is an apartment house which Stalin built for his cronies. And all these old Stalinists still live in there. It's the most elegant building in Moscow and is worthy of being on Central Park West. This is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You want to read about, this is where Mr. Gromyko hangs his hat. And you can read about this in the first circle in Solzhenitsyn. This is where they took him when they arrested him. The Hotel Ukraine. One whole floor of the Hotel Ukraine is devoted to eavesdropping equipment. Now, when Stalin uh, was uh, in his heyday, he was building these kinds of circles and things uh, for monumental walkways, uh, parade routes for the army to go through. And this is what he loved. He loved these hemicircles. They're rather handsome. This is an interesting building in that Stalin died in the middle of it. So you see it's faced here with uh, you see it's faced here with stone. And in here they didn't have enough stone or they decided that they couldn't afford to do this kind of thing anymore. So there were many, many buildings that were half clad in stone when, when Stalin died and Khrushchev came and he said, you can't do all this. You have to spend your money building housing, not monuments. So they decided to leave the, the, many of these apartments with their, their plain uh, uh, masonry. And they looked very handsome. But this is all left over from Stalin era. Now, when Khrushchev came in, he built, he was a very functional engineer type. So he built all of this stuff very rapidly. He wanted mass production. People were living in basements while they were building these gorgeous wedding cake buildings. And he thought that was outrageous. So he put up this kind of stuff. And uh, it's all falling apart, and they're now tearing it down, where the wedding cakes will last forever. And it's, very, it's prefab and so on. Now, uh, then after Khrushchev, we began to see some of this high-rise 14-story uh, towers, elevator towers, and all through. Moscow, these buildings were built in the 60s, and they're still very much in demand. There's still a housing shortage. The new housing in Moscow is a monolithic, uh, I'm sorry, megastructure housing, housing, and uh, it is not very desirable. It is not desirable. People don't like to live in this housing which is now being built because it's too big, it's impersonal, uh, it doesn't have facilities around it. They prefer the smaller kinds of housing. They complained about the school. They couldn't integrate. The planners can't integrate school planning and apartment planning because they're two different ministries. And you can't coordinate between ministries. So they have some of the same headaches we do. The, the acoustics in these buildings are so terrible you can hear your neighbor doing everything. So they don't like it. Uh, this is more housing. And a new university. This is a new uh, research collection of research institutes on the southwest of Moscow being built. Here is a housing plant, a prefabrication plant, building these slabs, which they 
haul off and and you'll see many trucks going through Moscow every day hauling this stuff. They are really very building a great deal in Moscow. It's a tremendously impressive. It's not very good construction, but the number of units is, is amazing. Here they tell you what's going to happen, which is sort of nice. Kalinin Prospect is uh, the urban renewal project, uh, which is near the uh, Kremlin. And uh, they wiped out a lot of old buildings building this piece of trash. Uh, they're very proud of it, and they think it's very modern and up-to-date. It's a combination of commercial activity and office activity. And uh, I guess it could be worse, but there were a lot of fine old buildings lost in this project. <coughs> very busy. You can see the juxtaposition of the old and new here with the old Abbot and the, uh, the new, new buildings. They think their big mistake was not providing a lot of parking. They kept an old church here and turned it into an exhibition hall, which was, I guess, better than losing it. Here is another new building which is being built for the Olympics. This is a hotel near uh, the exhibition area. This is the Comic-Con building I showed you before. Not very inspiring. This is the main cancer institute, which is just being opened on the outskirts of town. And this is a, a new office building, which uh, is being built on the south side of the city. Uh, here's some urban renewal and historic preservation combined. And you can see the sequence of uh, events. The old Stalin Ministry of Foreign Affairs, two towers, skyscraper curtain wall towers, and some new housing in here. But there was a nice old building here, so they decided they would integrate it into the fabric. So they, uh, <laughs> they're leaving it sandwiched in between these brick slabs. It's kind of a silly thing, I think. This is the main communication center for the Olympics under construction. And it shows a little bit of, uh, I think, uh, finesse. And uh, it will become, I believe, Komsomol headquarters when they're finished. Historic preservation, they're restoring some buildings in Moscow, <coughs> churches. Although you can never tell, some of the scaffolding can be up there for 10 years and no one will be on it. This church was in the middle of a housing project and they have decided to save it and not tear it down. So they are becoming very sensitive to some of the, uh, the older religious structures. And one of the most interesting things, uh, designs, uh, complexes in Moscow was the economic exhibition which uh, Stalin put up in the 50s to inspire the workers to great achievements. And it is called the Vida en Kuh. B D N K. Uh, don't ask me what that stands for, but it's on the uh, northeast side of Moscow, and it is one of the most unbelievable architectural extravaganzas I've ever seen. Each industry, each trade has a pavilion, and uh, uh, I can't tell you what each one of these uh, would be. One is uh, uh, agriculture, another one is atomic energy. Uh, this is the main central pavilion, and it is just absolutely incredible. Sort of Disneyland. And people are very proud of it. Here's Atomic Energy, a very modern building for a very modern industry. And you get certain ethnic kinds of overtones here. I'm not sure what this building is, but. And uh, the inside the space and aeronautical exhibition, you have Leica stuff. Do you remember Leica, the little dog that went up? There she is. And uh, here we have uh, some of the new rockets that they have put up. Uh, incidentally, the Soyuz Apollo is there on exhibition. And here's the cosmos and the monument to a Soviet space. Achievement. Now, so much for Moscow. I am going on long-winded here, but let me take you very quickly to a couple of other the other cities that I went to. I can't leave the Soviet Union without showing you the most beautiful city, uh, is, which is Leningrad. And here is the Neva River and uh, St. Isaac's Cathedral, the P Peter Paul Fortress where Peter the Great began this marvelous city, which is, uh, has, it's like a northern Venice with its 
and its water and its reflected light and its glorious skies. This is the Annapolis of the Soviet Union, the Naval Academy, and more there is the famous destroyer, the Avrora, the Aurora, which fired the shots which uh, began this, the Bolshevik Revolution. So it's a, this is a very important monument to them, and they've preserved it. And the city is the most beautiful city, uh, extraordinary city, with unbelievable skies and silhouettes. It's also a very hard city. It's a, it's a very tough city. The communists lean on it very hard because they distrust it. It is a Western city. It has always looked to the West, and therefore they are very strict, much stricter even than Moscow. And it's my suspicion that the success of the Mr. Brezhnev will be Mr. Romanov, who is the boss of Leningrad, which does not bode well for the future. The boss, the old stock exchange, a wonderful 19th century uh, classicizing building. And uh, the uh, area around the Winter Palace here. This is the Winter Palace, now the Hermitage, the museum with the wonderful uh, collection of art, which was going, some of which was going to come to the United States, and which an exhibition has now, unfortunately, been canceled by the United States government. And the naval, uh, the naval admiralty buildings of, by an Italian architect uh, from the Tsarist period. Marvelous plan complex of buildings here. St. Isaac's Cathedral, rivaling, <coughs> rivaling uh, some of the great churches in Italy and, and the Pantheon in Paris. Beautiful uh, 19th century monument. And uh, on the outskirts of Leningrad, one of the great historic preservation projects of the Soviet Union. This is Petro Dvoretz, the little palace of Peter. He went out in the summers to this palace. This was his summer cottage. It was totally leveled, almost leveled by the Nazis who had conquered this area during World War II. And through drawings, uh, they restored it completely. This is practically an entirely new building. They say Leningrad has two occupations. One is uh, shipbuilding, and the other is uh, historic restoration. But uh, it's successful. It's so, it's so lovingly done, so painstakingly done, that you can believe it's the real thing. And here is the canal in front of the building. Uh, at this time, the fountains were not working, but uh, it, the water flows down to the Gulf of Finland. It's a, a marvelous sight. They're very proud of this accomplishment. Here's an interior. This was completed in 1950. This, these interiors were all rebuilt. Here are some buildings on the outskirts of Leningrad. Uh, this is a 1920s uh, factory building, which was of some interest. And here you see some of the new micro rayon, micro rayons, uh, neighborhoods, complexes with the store, the transit stop that takes you into the center of Leningrad, and these enormous buildings enormous, endless structures of, that uh, are being built for workers. Uh, but they're very pleased to have this kind of housing and housing shortage. Another city I visited was Armenia's capital, Yerevan, which just reached the one million mark. And it was like leaving the Soviet Union. This is a, one of the 11 constituents union republics. But it... Uh, it's not like, uh, like the Russian Republic. Very free, open uh, feeling in this place. Now, it's not free, but it's, uh, it's much more lively, spontaneous, and uh, uh, has a, it's, it's like, leaving, like leaving Russia. And the food is much more plentiful here. This is the main opera house. And you get the very nice effects. Yerevan is built of volcanic stone, which is quarried locally, and it gives it a very beautiful color. And uh, this is the quality of the city. The original ancient citadel sits outside of town. They've done a great deal in Armenia to preserve their ancient heritage. As you know, there was a genocidal uh, offensive by the Turks on the Armenians. The Armenians looked to the Russians to, as protectors. They're very favorably disposed to the Russians since the Russians saved Armenians from extinction. And so the Armenians make a great deal of their local, of their own ethnic uh, heritage. And so, and part of that is restoration projects and museums, such as this very handsome museum of, of Armenian culture. 
because a lot of this is built with Armenian American money, which is sent over there. And there. They look very ha happily on American Americans because of the the contributions. Uh, here is the main square, a very handsome square made of this volcanic stone that I was describing to you. Uh, and here is another portion of it. And in Armenia, there are many old churches dating from the 8th century which are being restored. Here is one such church. Uh, it almost looks Romanesque, but it is many centuries before Romanesque period. And here is the interior. Some of these churches were not carved, not cut from stone, but carved out of, out of the mountainside. This stone, stone is so soft. <coughs> The, here is a, a restoration project completed a few years ago south of Yerevan, overlooking the hills in, in the distance, uh, the Iranian border. Hellenistic temple at Garni. Garni. Uh, this temple from the second century AD had tumbled about 1750 from an earthquake, and it was just lying about in a kind of a jigsaw puzzle, and was put back a couple of years ago very carefully. And you can see they've done a very fine job of distinguishing the old and the new, which is the way one ought to do these kinds of restorations. Very impressive restoration. New structures, they're much more lively than in Moscow. Very free. Look at these artistic kinds of attempts to liven up facades. Look at this prefabricated building and the Armenians have come in and added their own windows and had the, cloth, the clothes are hanging outside. If you did this in Moscow, you'd be arrested. But the Armenians are spontaneous and it makes a much more lively kind of place. Here's some more of these buildings in Tufa. And here's Karl Marx Institute. I gave a lecture at the architecture school here and it was very well received. Here's the monument to genocide, very handsome monument. And I was taken to uh, Archbishop, the uh, Catholicus, the uh, Pope of the Armenian Church, uh, for a blessing, uh, but he wasn't in. So I didn't get the blessing. Uh, but as I was getting on the plane to leave Yerevan, word came that he was sending his blessing after all. And we made it back to Moscow in Aeroflot, so I assume the blessing uh, was uh, operative. This building, this Holiday Inn, is really the uh, headquarters, new building for the Komsomol, the youth organization to which all youngsters have to belong. Here is another one of these wonderful old Armenian churches which are dotted all over Armenia. And a solid gold hachka which was given by a, I believe, a, a German Armenian or a British Armenian to the Armenian church. And here's the Armenian alphabet, a beautiful uh, script. And these were unveiled to me by a priest in the, uh, in the St. Peter's of the Armenian church outside of Yerevan. And here is a new museum, just opened, designed by uh, uh, one of the... Uh, faculty members at uh, Karl Marx Polytechnic Institute in Yerevan, preserving Armenian culture. And it is a wonderful combination of old and new. I think it's a marvelous building. There's a restaurant here, and uh, many of the uh, Armenian artifacts are housed here. And here is the, one of the most touching monuments that I've ever visited. This is the monument to genocide. And uh, they're playing here is piped in very soulful Armenian music, uh, religious music, and it is a very moving experience to come to this place. This is a successful monument, tremendously successful, <coughs> memorializing the millions of Armenians who were killed in genocide. I got back to Moscow. It was December. The snows were starting to fall, and it was time for me to go home. And I decided I would do what all good Russians want to do, head for the warm waters of the Mediterranean or the Persian Gulf. The Mediterranean seemed to be the easiest through the Black Sea. And so I went down to the a port of Odessa, Odessa on the left here. And this is my view from Moscow as I left it. A week later, it was 40 below zero. Odessa, I had expected palm trees on the Black Sea. And this is what I found. It was bitterly cold. But Odessa is a very beautiful city in its own right. It's Leningrad and the Black Sea, and a very handsome old 19th century city. And uh, I boarded a ship 
to leave the Soviet Union. I came by ship and left by ship and headed for Greece. And as I went out, I went down the Potemkin Steps, the famous steps made uh, famous by the Eisenstein movie where the great mutiny took place at the foot of the steps and the Tsar's soldiers slaughtered all the sailors in the 1905 rebellion. And they had built this new facility here. This is an illegal photo. I want you to look at this ship. This is the Yuri Gagarin. These are radar masts pointed to the sky to track satellites. And this ship belongs to the Soviet Academy of Sciences. So if you think they're backwards, they're not backwards. They're very advanced when they want to be. I sailed down through the Dardanelles and the Bosporus to Greece. And I went and I sat on the Acropolis and pondered the meaning of what I had been through and pondered the origins of the democratic system in Greece. And I'm still pondering the meaning of what I experienced in the Soviet Union. I would have to say that the Soviet Union is not monolithic. It is a police state. It is totalitarian. But there are people there who are free spirits. I think we should continue our dialogue with the Soviet Union. I think the Fulbright exchange should be resumed. It has stopped. And I think that we must somehow come to some understanding, and they must come to some understanding of us, because we won't survive if we don't. It was a tremendously exciting experience. I want to go back in some ways, in other ways I don't. But I'm happy I've had the chance to share this with you tonight. And if you have any questions, I would be very happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much.